Well, I want to add my welcome to Pastor John and our James River campus, Pastor Mac and the Buford Road campus, and those of you joining us online and the great crowd we have here. Wherever you are, you've been worshiping in this past uh, few minutes. I would uh, ask you to join me in thanking our worship teams. Would you just allow some hand praise for them? They do such great, 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 great job. So thankful for them. Well, so the husband was sitting there talking with his wife, and he said, I just don't get it. I, I, I don't understand I get so angry when we fight with each other and you somehow seem so calm. You just, you just kind of remain under control. How do you do it? She said, well, it's really kind of simple. When I get that angry, if I'm that angry, I just go upstairs and clean the toilet. He said, what, I don't, what, what do you mean you go upstairs and clean the toilet? What does that do? How, how does that fix anything? She said, well, I use your toothbrush to do it. <laughs> Let's be honest. Anger can be fun. Can I get a little Amen. Anger can be fun. Frederick Beekner even says, of the seven deadly sins, anger is probably the most fun. He goes on to describe it. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations yet to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. And after this apt description, he then also gives us the conclusion, which is the chief drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Well, as you know, we're continuing our series in the seven deadly sins, the seven, the seven deadly vices, these kind of destructive habits that really undermine the goodness of our character. Uh, they're vices and habits that when we fall into them, we don't see things clearly uh, as we should be. And obviously, these vices destroy all kinds of relationships between each other, even the relationships we have with ourselves. But our relationship with God, too, is on the line. We've been looking at pride. We've been looking at envy today. We venture into anger, the kind of anger that's a, a really a strong feeling of annoyance or displeasure or hostility. It kind of boils, right? Where the kind where you think about almost getting red in the face, if you will. And that anger can be triggered by really all kinds, a multiplicity of other emotions. Think about this with me. If you're feeling anxiety, which means you feel, we feel out of control of the circumstances around us and we can't fix it, well, that can generate anger sometimes. What about sadness or grief? There are certainly times that I get angry because I've lost something or lost someone, so anger is triggered by the grief or loss. What about fear? Gosh, yes, when we're feeling threatened by someone or a certain situation comes on us, we have that, that kind of anger, that emotion that comes into fight or flight, if you will. Feeling guilty, maybe even uh, can cause one to kind of erupt in anger. Nobody likes to feel guilty. And so kind of we get into this anger mode as a kind of a self-protection to kind of take care of ourselves. The same way about being embarrassed. If you've ever been embarrassed, it's a terrible feeling that can often, often initiate an angry response from us. Talk about envy. We looked at it last week in terms of uh, being envious over what someone else has that we really want and we don't want them to have it to the point we become angry about it. Jealousy can do the same thing to us. And then there is also seeing an injustice. When we see someone being uh, taken advantage of or, uh, or some system that's not really fair, the sources of our anger are seemingly endless when we think about it because it's a response we have to so many other feelings. It's almost like we get one of these feelings and the way we're going to respond, the way we're going to show it is through anger. The bottom line is anger occurs when we don't, when, when, when what we want to happen doesn't happen. At the very shortest definition of it, when things don't go our way, people don't listen to us, people don't pay us any mind or consult with us in any way. And if you think about it, if any of that sounds kind of arrogant, it may be because it is just a little bit. The, the root of anger is that something has been taken from us. That's the way we feel. We feel like something is owed to us, and we feel like it's a right. It's a privilege that we have to express our anger. The sad part about that is we feel like it's a right no matter how we choose to express that anger. We express it everywhere, don't we? In our homes, in restaurants, in retail stores, in grocery stores. In conversations we have with people, especially today around political discourse, we get angry in our cars. It's been, it's been called road rage. We get angry at sporting events when refs don't make the right calls or our players don't play as well as we want them to. We get angry at work when things don't go the way we want them to go. 
We even get angry at church. Lord, help us if we have to have a business meeting over a contentious issue. Anger comes out. And then, of course, we would never forget that anger also happens at the DMV. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Some social commentators have actually said we're living in the age of rage right now. When you step back and you look at, at everything that's going on and how explosive tempers seem to be, it's not hard to understand that kind of description. And yet, having said all of this, this capacity that you and I have to feel anger, well, it's God-given. God gave it to us. Indeed, anger, he says, in and of itself as a feeling is not a sin. Matter of fact, none of the feelings we have are sinful. It's what we choose to do with them that might make them, simple, uh, make them sinful. But the reality is anger, our anger, anger can actually be virtuous. I mean, we can, call it, uh, we can call it holy, if you will. Holy anger. When you look at it, someone said the world needs to be angry. The world often continues to allow evil because it isn't angry enough. I like the way Dr. Siemens writes. He says anger is divinely, a divinely implanted emotion, closely allied to our instinct for right. It is designed to be used for constructive spiritual purposes. The person who cannot feel anger at evil is a person who lacks enthusiasm for good. So if you cannot hate wrong, he would say it's very questionable whether you really love righteousness or not. We'll call it holy anger. The Bible might call it righteous anger. The kind of anger that's, that is justified when it's aimed at what is needed for justice to be done. The kind of anger that targets whatever uh, is threatening that which is good and wholesome and healthy around us. The kind of anger that's, uh, that kind of motivates us towards a cause for good, if you will. Our anger can even be an investment mo emotion in terms of what we care about. Uh, this is best evidenced in the scripture today. Our passage of Jesus cleansing the temple courts of the thieves and the robbers. It's Passover time. Imagine Jerusalem filled with millions, millions of Jews. And part of the ritual that they do is they come to the temple courts and there they present a lamb. A pure lamb to be sacrificed. Well, this is where the scamming started right off the bat. The priests had this deal amongst themselves that whoever brought in a lamb, no matter what, we would find a blemish on it. It wouldn't be good enough for the sacrifice. Therefore, that family then had to take their earnings and go and buy another lamb from them at an exorbitant price. But that's not the only way they called them. They called them also in the exchange of money. They had to use temple shekels. And so in order to purchase the temple shekels, they charged an exorbitant exchange rate too. And it is into this that you've got thousands, literally thousands of people in the temple courts. Remember, the temple courts are where the Jews were meant to pray. All of this is going on in the midst of all this. this. This criminal racket was taking place. And it is to this that Jesus becomes indignant with the cheating and the scandal that's going on in the one place that should have been set aside for prayer in the temple courtyard. But the courtyard was full of cheaters and scammers. Indeed, they were fleecing the Jews, no pun intended. That's what made Jesus really angry. And with that, that's why he said, is it not written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? And it was with this righteous anger, this holy anger, that then we read about Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. Now, we have to be really careful with this. In that you and I are not Jesus. And we don't get to express our anger by turning over the tables, if you will. In order for us to have righteous anger, then we need to figure out how is it that we can exhibit that kind of anger that Jesus had. Because that standard is really high. It's holy, if you will. Indeed, and it calls for a, a, di a divine kind of discernment. The kind that doesn't happen in a flash, I wouldn't think. And I would suggest that Jesus' anger was rightly towards issues. If you think about it, not individuals themselves, it was the sin that angered him that was being committed by the individuals. But he didn't necessarily get angry at the individuals themselves, just what was taking place. And that's where we often struggle for clarity. Because when we get angry, we get angry at the person, not the issue that has created it. And so we end up dehumanizing the person, if you will committing what some might even say is murderous. Jesus described it. If you call someone a fool and in your anger, then you're murdering the, hu the humanity, the, div the, the divinity in that person of God's creation. 
Perhaps the prayer that could lead us to holy anger, righteous anger, would be the one Peter Scazzaro writes in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Lord, help me to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way. That's a whole lot of rightness going on while my temperature's going up. How about you? This is the dangerous part. I would maintain, really, that our anger as a vice, this kind of habit, continues to be something that undermines the goodness of our character, something that doesn't allow us to see things clearly enough to discern that kind of divinity and holy anger. And indeed, it, we know that it destroys relationships. You think about those that you've been angry with and where those relationships are today. And the Bible records over and over strict condemnations about anger. Psalm 37, 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. In Ecclesiastes 7, 9, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the laps of fools. Thinking about all this, I thought, yeah, man, there's lots of ways that people exhibit anger. I found this kind of a humorously convicting list, if you will, the kind of approaches to anger. There's the toxic waste approach. Toxic waste people kind of just bury and stuff down their anger way inside of them. And they present this kind of I'm okay appearance out here. But then the problem is over the years, what happens to the toxic waste is it begins to leak. So we can become known as a leaking angry Christian over nothing. What may seem as nothing, but it's all that toxic waste built up. Or perhaps yours is the volcano approach. Volcano people talk and rumble for some time until they finally get to the point where they what? They just simply erupt. And there's no controlling that spew once it comes out. Or perhaps you like the snow cone approach. Some snow cone people go silent and put on the big chill. They just kind of ignore you like you're not even in the room. They emotionally cut you off and so they ignore your existence. And their anger comes out in the silence that they create. And then there's the microwave approach. Probably one of the most dangerous, Right? quick to heat up, and then it's overcooked before you know it. Beep, 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 kabam, right? You've been around folks like this. It's almost like an instantaneous response to whatever it is. And so I'm sitting there wondering, I wonder, does, would anybody raise their hand and say, well, yeah, you, you kind of hit my description there. I know mine's in there. Here's the thing. Any of these styles cost us. They cost us dearly. They cost us physically. With the physical damage it does to our bodies when we, become, when we allow ourselves to become that angry. Indeed, it, it affects our relationship with others and certainly with God. And here's the thing. Any person capable of angering us, in some ways, they kind of become our master, don't they? They kind of own us because it's our choice as to whether or not we let them make us angry or we allow ourselves you know, I've heard it all my life. Speak when, when we're angry and we will make the best speech we will ever regret. Or for every minute we remain angry, we give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. We're giving it up. We're handing it over. We're giving permission. What are we to do? How can we find a remedy? The Bible is here for us and I believe, I believe provides the best biblical approach in three steps in James 1.19. There are the three steps, and they're all three are disciplines, one right after another. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. James says, remember the brother of Jesus who wrote the book? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Three disciplines right there. Let's break those down for just a moment. Let's camp here. My dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen. Listen to what? Listen to who? Well, this may sound strange. I want to suggest that first and foremost, we need to listen to ourselves. We need to listen within to ask ourselves this very simple question. What am I really angry about? I know I'm feeling angry, but what's caused this? What's triggered me to become anger? Because more times than not, our anger is simply a response to some other emotion, some other feeling. And we need to name that feeling if we want to start controlling our anger. It's a response born out of emotionally healthy spirituality. You remember the whole tagline, we cannot be spiritually mature and remain emotionally immature. And so towards this, maturity calls on us to name the true emotion that is driving our energy towards being angry. Dallas Willard said, feelings are, with good exceptions, good servants, but they are disastrous masters. 
So if we allow ourselves, if we don't find out what the true feeling is that's driving our anger, we've got to have the ability to name it, claim it, tame it, and aim it. You get those? You've got to name it. What is this feeling I'm having? And claim it. I'm having that feeling that's causing me to be angry, but I need to deal with this other emotion. So I have to tame it, get it under control, and then aim that energy. Every feeling is an energy within us. And that's why it often comes out as anger. And so if we take the time to investigate what's really at the root of our anger, it's often we feel like we've been wronged by somebody or something. And often because our expectations were not met. Now you talk about a powerful learning. Expectations. There's a danger within our expectations because sometimes they're not even conscious. We're not even conscious of them. We just expect certain things from certain people. We expect things to be a certain way. So some of them are not even conscious. Some of them are not spoken. We don't speak them out loud. I expect you to, right? And, and some of them are not realistic. And then you've got, we really, most times they're not agreed upon. Now you think about that. If I've got an expectation of you and I'm not even conscious of it, I've not spoken it to you, I, it's not realistic and we haven't agreed on it, you would probably look at me and say, you have no right to have that expectation of me. That's the very same conversation we need to be having with ourselves in the mirror when we're being driven to anger. What is this emotion? Is it because I've got some expectation that has not been met? So we become angry. Let's talk to ourselves when angers. We do well to talk to ourselves, to listen to ourselves. Tom, what are you really angry at? What's, what's really driving you? Is it good, holy anger to be directed towards something redeemable or something redeeming? Or is it a hellish kind of anger, a selfish kind of anger? Seeking to hurt back somebody because I've got an expectation that wasn't met. My dear brothers and sisters, James says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Listen to ourselves, yes. And perhaps quick to listen to someone else's take on our anger. Do we ever stop to take time and say, friend, I, I need your help with something. I, this is what happened. Do you think I have any, is any of my anger justified? And these are people who will be honest with us, not just tell us what we want to hear. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So we ought to listen to ourselves. We ought to listen to those who are wise around us. And certainly we ought to, we ought to listen to God. I don't know about you. I'm guilty. I'll just say it right up front. When I become angry, it's the last thing I think of doing. I'm saying, God, do I have a right to be angry? God, is it okay that I'm angry? I think 99.9% .9 of the time, no will be the answer. Listening to God. And of course we listen to the scripture. Be angry and do not sin. We've been given two ears to listen and one mouth to talk. And so many times I've gotten that equation backwards. I know that. It goes without saying to practice this incarnational listening. If I'm angry with someone that I need to be practicing and really listening to them, not working on my next retort while they're talking guilty. But there's a second part of this biblical equation. And that is we're to be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Weighs, it means we take time to measure, to be slow to speak here. May I ask a question? Is there anyone listening who doesn't like to have the last word when you're angry? Is there anyone who doesn't? I want the last word. Even if it's a mumble under my breath leaving, right? <laughs> Slow to speak means that we find a way to speak with humility and with patience. That indeed, whatever we say, we don't say in haste, but with care and precision and to be honest and truthful, to speak it clearly. Because acting in this kind of wisdom means that we listen carefully, consider prayerfully, and then speak quietly. I like the story of the couple that was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary and she was offering advice as to how, how they had been able to have this long, happy marriage. She said, well, on my wedding day, I decided to make a list of 10 of my husband's faults, which for the sake of our marriage, I would choose to overlook. And somebody said, wow, that's, that's pretty good. What were some of the faults? She said, well, actually to tell you the truth, I never did get around to making the list. But whenever my husband did something that made me hopping mad, I would say to myself, lucky for him, it's not on the list. That's pretty good strategy, wouldn't you say? And then we'd be slow to anger, quick to listen, slow to speak, 
and slow to anger. We've heard it said, I've said it. When you get angry, count to 10 or 100 or 1,000, depending on who you are. A lady named Leslie said, my younger brother had uh, quite a temper as a boy. Uh, she talked about how her, their parents had really tried to work with him and, and, and to give him a lot of attention and to be patient with him, but he just had these terrible temper tantrums, just outbursts. And finally one day, he was having one, and uh, she said, my dad went to the shed and came in and brought him a shovel. And he said, son, you take this shovel and you go out there in the yard and you start digging holes until you can get your anger under control. She said, it was amazing. It worked. I mean, he really turned out as a great young man. And so the friend asked him, well, what, is, what does he do today? What, what's his job? He said, well, he's, he builds in-ground swimming pools. So, I mean, you got to find the strategy. That'll hit some of you later. you got to find the strategy for what to do when you become angry so that you, there's slowness built into it. And so we need to ask, how do we control our anger? Do we, do we dig holes? Do we count to 10? Do we go for a walk? Do we scream? Do we holler? We all need to find this way to discover God's spirit in the midst of a divinely implanted emotion. He gave it to me. He gave it to you. He gave it to us to guard it and to use it well for it to be holy anger, not hellish angry. And so often it might just be mean. It just might come down to saying, I am so angry right now. I need to walk away and I'll come back and we'll deal with this. Whatever it may be. You and I both know this. Anger can be the arsenic of relationships. Indeed, it'll poison our ability to relate to others and certainly to God. Psalms 4.4 4 makes a suggestion. Tremble and do not sin. And when you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. In other words, it's an invitation to get out of the moment, get out of the heat of the moment and let the still hours of the night bring calmer and wiser thoughts and better directions to our words. It's wise for us. Three disciplines. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. How are you doing with yours? And as we're going to close every sermon in this series, this prayer, Lord, we ain't what we ought to be. Lord, we ain't what we could be. And Lord, we know we ain't what we should be. But thanks be to you, God, we ain't what we used to be. Because of Jesus Christ, keep working on us. Pray with me. Father God, into these moments when our cap campus pastors will come and challenge us, I pray for your presence to be made known in each heart and mind and soul of everyone listening so that we will be honest with ourselves in these moments to ask, what has God said to me in this hour of worship? Let us not run from you, O oh God, but let us open our minds and our hearts and our souls before you in this moment of integrity and truth as you deal with us, knowing that you love us and want only the best for us. Amen.